very exciting to be here again alone after so many events in the last month. I feel like my head is spinning. Um, the generosity uh, that Priska has showed me in uh, this exhibition, but as well the symposiums and performances that we've done, they're taxing, they're, they're a lot of work, and um, they create cultural capital. And sometimes in the day and age that we live in, in the art world that we live in, cultural capital uh, is, doesn't seem as important. But for Prisca, cultural capital is as important as market capital. And I think that's very rare. And I think that this space here, uh, hopefully, could be a special place in West Germany where the values uh, that Peter Weibel initiated and was an important part of the art scene as an artist, as a theorist, and now as a curator, we could rekindle that sphere here at Prescott. You know, maybe that's what this is all about. And it's such an exceptional, um, you know, an amazing, Thing that Peter is here, I appreciate it so much, and I know that uh, Priska and Carl also appreciate it. So thank you very much for coming. So, um, Noi, I'm going to say a few, just a few words, and then we're going to switch into high mode and get going. Noise and the possibility of a future. Music is prophecy. Its styles and economic organization are ahead of the rest of society because it explores much faster than material reality can the entire range of possibilities in a given code. It makes audible the new world that will gradually become visible, that will impose itself and regulate the order of things. Jacques Attali, Noise, the political economy of music. Noise is prevalent in our post-industrial society, whether it is the cacophony of the factory and the war machine that initially inspired futurists such as Luigi Russolo, the dissidence of the public space which encouraged indoor living in earlier times and noise barriers along the highway today, or that excess which diminishes efficiency in communication network systems the so-called Shannon theory of the noisy, channel coding theorem. Noise gets a bad rap as something considered offensive and that needs to be controlled or mitigated. However, noise has another side, more positive, positive and emancipatory. This conference, utilizing the history of noise and music to stake a claim for noise as a liberating mode of production, while at the same time understanding its dystopian possibility that modes of production, baleful mirror image. Uh, as the uh, introductory quote implies, music and noise create new possibilities for the form, shapes, and events active in the cultural landscape, and as we will see for the brain and mind as well. Crucial for us here is that our bodies, their sensory membranes, have become not only the overstimulated site of media industry messages and subliminal seduction, but the crucial terrains in the ongoing maintenance of ourselves as points of circulation, and that for, therefore, and furthermore, it is now the role of the creative industries, once the site of alterity, to produce an efficient image to trap, fix, shape, and automate our, our powers of perception. And you know that we're always on our iPhones. What a perfect example. <clears throat> okay, so that's where I'll leave it as the introduction, and then I wanted to introduce Peter Weibel, and then uh, Matthew, who has worked with Peter before, and know each other. Uh, Matthew is going to start the conversation. Uh, okay, okay. So let me give a few introductions for Peter. Peter Weibel, born in Odessa, 1944. Peter Weibel studied literature, medicine, logic, philosophy, and film in Paris and Vienna. We have that in common. I didn't know I studied medicine as well, so that's interesting. 
He became a central figure in European media art on account of his various activities as artist, media theorist, curator, and as nomad between art and science. Since 1984, he's been a professor at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna from 1984 to 1989. He was head of the Digital Arts Laboratory at the Media Department of, of New York University in Buffalo. And in 1989, he founded the Institute of New Media at the Stadelschule in Frankfurt on the Main, which he directed until 1994. Between 1986 and 1995, he was in charge of Arts Electronica in Linz as artistic director, and from 1993 to 1998, he commissioned the Australian pavilions at the Venice Biennale. From 1993 to 2011, he was chief curator at the Neue Galerie Graz. He was artistic director of the Seville Biennial in 2008 and the fourth Moscow Biennial of Contemporary Art in 2011. Since 2015, he is curator of, of Licht Sicht 5, Projection Biennial in Bad Rothenfeld. Since 1999, Peter Weibel is chairman and CEO of ZKM, Center for Art, Media, and Karlsruhe. Peter was granted honorary doctorates at the University of Art and Design in Helsinki in 2007 and by the University, I can't pronounce it, but Pes in Hungary in 2013, 2008. He was awarded with the French distinction Officier dans l'ordre des arts et des lettres. The following year, he was appointed a full member of the Bavarian Academy of Fine Arts in Munich, and he was awarded the, Euro the Europesche Cultural Project Prix of the European Foundation for Culture. In 2010, he was decorated with the Austrian Cross of Honor for Science and Art, first class, and since 2013, he is active member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts in Salzburg. 2014, he received the Oscar Kokoschka Prize. At the threshold between art and science, Peter Weibel has been a pioneer in the relation between iconoclasm, destruction, and the void. A participant along with Otto Mule, Wolf Lastel, Hermann Nietzsche, and Yoko Ono in the Destruction in Art Symposium in London in 1996 and the seminal gathering of the destruction artists from all over the world organized by Gustav Metzger, John Sharkey, and Ivor Davies, Weibel Bible co-curated at ZKM, ZKM 2002, the groundbreaking exhibition along with, among, among others, Bruno Latour, Iconoclash, Beyond the image, image Wars in Science, Religion, and Art, a pairing of kinds that led to the following exhibition, Making Things Public, Atmospheres of Democracy, again at ZKM 2005, and again curated together with Bruno Latour, addressing the challenge of renewing politics by applying it to the spirit of art and science. His ongoing concerns with a renewed understanding of the museum, highlighted amongst others through his seminal text, Museums in the Post-Industrial Mass Society, presents us with a radical view on the conception of the museum as a most striking and challenging understanding of the anti-museum. So I will now leave it to Matthew. Bio on Matthew. I'm the late one. Good. Let me just introduce Matthew uh, second. Uh, curator Matthew Copeland, born 1977, lives in London, has been developing a practice seeking to subvert the traditional role of exhibitions to renew our perception of these. Amongst many others, he co-curated the exhibition Voids, a retrospective at the Centre Pompidou in Paris and the Kunsthalle in Bern, and edited the anthology Voids. He, he curated a choreographed exhibition at the Kunsthalle Saint Gallen uh, and Ferme de Buisson, soundtrack for an exhibition at the Musée d'Art Contemporaire Lyon. He curated and initiated the series of spoken word exhibitions, reprise, and the exhibitions to hear read. Three volumes so far, all recently at the ICA in Philadelphia this February 2012. Forthcoming exhibitions include Phil Noblack, a retrospective of films exhibition, and the upcoming publications include Gustav Lutzker, Writings, Letters, Conferences, Interviews, 1953-2012, and choreographing an exhibition to be published in the spring of 2012. What a perfect person to have to speak with Peter. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Sorry I'm late again, but uh, I 
I'm so pleased to be here. It's such a great show, one congratulations. Thank you, Chris Kathy Sanchea, putting everything together. Thank you, Peter, for joining us today. It seems so accurate, um, that's why I was really begging Warren to let me on the panel with you. At first, I was really looking forward to being on, on your own with him. But I was like, oh, what an opportunity to be here together. Because the first time we wrote to one another was at the time I was creating the voice perspective together with um, your old friend, uh, unfortunately long gone now, Gustav Metzger. And that's the moment when you wrote me this beautiful line about the void, the um, iconoclasm and destruction. And it seems to be so fitting for Warren's exhibition today to start with destruction as simply as that. And I think, um, of course, we could take case studies such as a beautiful piece here, which is reminiscent of so many works that we love and adore, which are from Robert Morris, of course, with the, the box with the sound of its own making, but also the destruction of the speaker itself. And somehow, not so much to deconstruct the speakers that we have here, but to start from there and um, to touch upon what you have done with such majestic, first with destruction and then to open up with my obsession, and I hope Warren will forgive me for that, with the notion of the museum yeah, that you have reframed in such a beautiful way, in a radical way, shall I say, and that's why it was a great joy that Warren was mentioning that seminal text of yours in the museum in the post-industrial mass society. Which is, do you think, what can be a museum today? But first of all, let's not talk about today, but then. And can you tell us how your interest, or may I say obsession, with destruction came about? Thank you, Warren, for your introduction. So much sound and fury, what one person. Thank you. I would like to introduce uh, us into the subject why we are here about noise. Uh, as you know, the word noise has a very important meaning in music, but also in information theory. And uh, noise is, in, uh, is an information theory, what we call entropy. So on one side we have the idea of noise uh, and of, uh, and of uh, 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 entropy. On the other side we have the idea of music and information. We have to remember, which is most of them forgotten, that 1913. Yeah? 1913 was not only the beginning of abstract art, when Malevich painted, also not painted, but made a drawing the first time with the black square. 1913 was the first read by Petitjean, yeah? but also 1913 was the publication of Russell, uh, Art of Noise. So in fact, yeah, noise started at the beginning of modern art. Yeah? And it is a pity that art historians only speak about the show and about Kandinsky, not about, not about the evolution of noise in, in modern art, which was the beginning of what we call today sound art. Yeah? So we have to remember the noise was at this very moment a kind of illegal kind of music. Yeah? It was banned from everywhere. It yeah? still is banned today. Yeah? When you go to a concert hall, uh, when you go to an opera, Still today, in Germany and everywhere, they build houses for millions of money, yeah? for millions of money, for old kind of, of music from 19th century. Yeah? Yeah? And the beginning of the 20th century, we had the introduction of noise, and uh, people like uh, not only Russell, but also Varese, Varese, and St. John Cage, yeah? they said everything that got makes sound is music. Yeah? That means everything that makes sound, a glass, whatever, any object that makes sound can be a music instrument. Yeah? So they have expanded the vocabulary of music enormously. Yeah? So they have expanded, as is now important, the vocabulary of music, not only including uh, harmony, the so called music. After Schoenberg, we already had the emancipation of disharmony. Then, with uh, Weber, we had the emancipation of the break, of the still, of the pause. And then finally, we have the emancipation of noise. Noise has become part uh, of the musical uh, 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 cosmos. Several, we have, we have mentioned Jacques Attali. Yeah? I just remember, which is important, that, I can, that, that Jacques Attali in his book about noise made three uh, phases. First phase of music was a ritual, yeah? and people in the old tribal societies invented music as a ritual yeah? to organize the cosmos. No? Same thing, same, same period, what we call today classic music. This was a representation, 
music becomes a kind of representation huh, of bourgeois order, of harmony, etc. Huh? And now, after two world wars, it's very clear this bourgeois idea of harmony is what does not function anymore after two world wars. Huh? So we have noise huh, as, as kind of dissonance, even of social dissonance, etc. etc. Huh? And therefore, this account of the noise is so important, not only for that, but also for information theory. In Germany, we have it very nice. In Germany, we have the word Geräusch, then we have the word Rauschen, which means noise, yeah. then we have the word Gerücht, from Geräusch to Gerücht. It's a very wonderful example here. Uh, what is noise in music could be called uh, something like uh, Gerücht yeah, in German, yeah, because there was this rumor uh, of a kind of battlefield circular uh, in the basement in Washington. Yeah. This was in fact entropy, it was not information. Yeah. So you see, we have, to be, we have to be very careful to make a difference between the meaning of noise in music, the meaning of noise in information theory, the communication theory. And on finally, at the end, it was important to remember that 1996, uh, we have discovered what is called the cosmic background, microwave radiation. Uh, so there have been some scientists uh, who, who made uh, work with radio telescope, and they heard some, some noise. They have been thinking that this noise comes from the instrument. Yeah? And after many tests, they discovered no, this noise comes from the Big Bang, from the beginning of the universe. Yeah? So we know now from today, we know that since about nearly 15 billion of years, there's a noise traveling through all the universe, yeah? which is called, which is a microwave, uh, microwave. so it's called cosmic micro microwave background radiation. Hmm? And people even say that. 5% of the noise on television uh, is still what you see from this cosmic background radiation. Hmm? So we can say, what this is now simply from my uh, idea, the cosmos itself, the cosmos itself is a kind of noisy channel. Hmm? Hmm? And what we do now, to perhaps we are living with this noisy channel, the cosmos, and what we do now is a human mission, we try to change this entropy into kind of information, which has to find a kind of order. I give you an example. When you look at this calf, it looks like noise. Yeah? But in fact, yeah, it, is a, it is what it is, a one-dimensional cellular automata invented by Wolfram in the ruler I applied was rule 105. So when you take another rule by Wolfram, maybe 99, you have another pattern. So the pattern what you see here is a construction by an algorithm. Uh, and it, uh, so it was made with a computer, the broken comes a computer, and even woven with a computer, not by human hand. So it, does, it, is also not, it is not noise, it is invisible, not detectable information for you. Yeah? So it has a, it's a kind of one-dimensional cellular automata. Yeah? So, so what we do now, what you see here, for example, is this model, and over here in the other model, you see ruins of science. Yeah? So you, you have collected little elements, which are not an alphabet, uh, but who remind sometimes to a form, we can discover, we can take some kind of elements from alphabets or, or forms, uh, but in fact there's also more entropy than information. But this is what we try to do in our mission, uh, to turn the noise no and channel of the universe to the music of the universe. Yeah, I think it's also very interesting when you, when you look into your practice, I mean, you've touched on the ground right now, that of course it'd be able wonderful to go back to the noise of the image but then in a second time. I think what would be interesting to take is um, the title of one of your last book um, together with Bruno that, that Warren mentioned the idea of making things public which would be a great definition of what an exhibition can be and I'm really interested to find out with you what your understanding of making things public would be when it comes to noise, how to show noise. So, uh... The evolution of music, uh, we, we see a, a, another step downstairs as the performance tonight. Because around 1950, yeah, uh, people real, realized the concept of indeterminacy. Yeah, yeah, so, some kind of uncertainty yeah, yeah, and indeterminacy. Yeah, they did not know how to handle these new sources of sound. Yeah, yeah. Then they made something what, we, what they called graphic notation. This is what you precisely see in the basement. Yeah. Uh, you can explain it yourself how you did it, but you have a graphic notation, mm -hmm. yeah, which means it is an instruction to the performer who gives him a certain freedom. Yeah. It, is, it does not say you must play this note in that manner. Yeah. So, so he was winning a lot of freedom, the freedom of interpretation. Yeah. The nature of the means, 
the freedom of noise. You could develop yourself a specific noise, which was not dictated by the composer. And then there was a problem that people did not understand, not the music, not the musicians, not the concert people. So after 10 years, the movement of graphic notation disappeared. But they came back, because today we call it graphic surface notation. Today we have a computer which has a graphic surface, uh, yeah, and you touch the surface and it creates music. Yeah? So that means, it's, it's the fifth people invented or later, 20 years before all the people power out there and see the very invented the graphic surface notation. Yeah? So the position has been the right track. But what it means now today yeah, is the normal notation yeah, where musician is mm, the destruction. Yeah? You, first you have to learn the code, how to read the code, then you have to learn how to play the code, how to execute the so code, the notation. No? But today, in the computer time, the instruction is also the execution. No? You give an example. No? When you make a calculation on paper, no? then uh, you write down a number, 6 and 3 plus 17 equals the same signal that when you write is 80. No? But when you have a calculator machine, you press all the buttons, no? and then you say equal, the machine is calculated of you, the machine says it is 80. Since the 3 plus 7, it is 80. That means here you have a notation, a machine code, which is instruction and execution. So this is different from the old, the old notation. That means now, when we show today yeah, this modern contemporary music, which does not happen in concert hall. So we have now the paradox that the music that is essential is not played in the concert hall. Yeah? Not playing as a radio, not playing the television. The only place mainly where you hear music in the century is the museum. It's precisely what you said, how do you show noise? Yeah. You only can show it in the, in the museum. Right? So the contemporary music in a certain way is an exile. Right? And the name of the exile is museum. Right? Mm -hmm. I think I think it's, there's one mistake that actually happened with classic music, that all the progress people have been done by machine music, synthesizer, yeah? it moved into the popular music. Yeah? So popular music, in a certain sense, synth pop and also, have been much more open to new sounds than classic music. Yeah? Classic music did not extend, not open the door for the new electronic music. Yeah? But pop music now is so massively successful yeah? because in a certain way it was more free. Yeah? So now we have, the museum has two problems. The pop music is now our antagonist. And the concert hall is now antagonist. Huh? Huh? The same way we have so many museums who take care of showing music precisely. Huh? So when you go in a normal museum, then you, don't find, find, you don't find any piece of music or sound. Huh? Huh? It has a problem because the classical musicians like Beethoven and Bach, they have been not really musicians because they did not leave us music. They only left us paper. Notations or two dimensional paper. Huh? This is what they have. But make both of the, but modern composers like Cage, not even Cage, but like Stockhausen, or Cologne, he left us music. He composed 124 hours in the studio, so when he died, he left us music, music generated by him. Yeah. And now, when I talked to him several times, what could we do? And I said to him, I give you several spaces permanently by museum yeah, to show your music. But he was too ambitious. He's, he, he wanted the whole museum. Yeah. <laughs> So I said, dear Stockhausen, I can't do it. <laughs> I cannot give 50,000 square meters only to your music. Yeah? Then they stopped the discussion. Yeah? Yeah. So I could not, but I'm still willing yeah? to give, give some musicians permanent space in the museum as part of the collection. Because it's very important, we have to show noise, we have to show sound out from today. Yeah? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's wonderful to think the museum has both an emitter and a receiver. And that's what's uh, quite interesting about what you just said in that regard. Also, um, to take upon the idea of the graphic score, yeah. it's wonderful because it, of course, leads me to somebody with whom we've been very close, which is Henry Flint. And here, when we think of Flint and the, an anthology and really the birth of a renewed understanding of what could be the graphic score in that yeah. regard, and there comes a very interesting moment to say, what do we have? What are we confronted with? Is it something that we can decipher or go to the and thus visual noise? Or is it something that we can play along with? And how do we move from there? I think, that, you know, the, and you know, far better than I could, the tra trajectory of Flint in that regard would be fascinating from the high avant music all the way to Hilly Billy. 
and how you would justify that as an array and authority into popular culture, which is what noise has become now. Maybe you want to say a few words about your relationship in that regard with Flint and that discussion that you may have had about music. We can find, for instance, online that beautiful concert that you organized of Flint playing his own music for a point. As I said, the idea of noise moved, for example, to the same as British city pop group Art of Noise. Yeah? Yeah? And the producer even made a record uh, called Chan Bumba after the birth of Marinetti. Yeah? Yeah? And, uh, and the industrial noise and all these groups in, in, the, in the, the pop area, pop area, industrial noise, throwing this, etc. etc. So it was the pop music who took up the idea of noise much more yeah? than the so called highly avant Serve it would be really important. What I said at the beginning, when modern art started, not only with object art, not only with abstract art, but only with music, with sound, with noises, uh, it's strange uh, that they have to have neglected this part. Uh, and we have, to, we have to try to correct it uh, in the coming century. Uh, we have to find ways. But coming back to, for a moment to Stockhausen, uh, when we had a discussion, how to devote some permanent place to the museum. And when I did not give him the whole museum, he wrote me a letter, Mr. Weibel, you're treated me like nothing. Hmm? Hmm? You treat me like shit. And I said, no, no, you know yourself, Mr. Stockhausen, that you are one of the most important composers of the 20th century. Uh, so, don't tell, so don't call yourself, I'm nothing. Because he said, so you're right, because I'm nothing. So I wrote him back. No, no, uh, you know yourself that you're not nothing, that you're one of the most important composers of the century. Then he wrote back, who are the other ones? <laughs> <laughs> then I said, Schoenberg and Weber, okay, Pulli, uh, and Pulis. Schoenberg and Weber, uh, okay, it's correct. Then he started to be friendly against me. Yeah. Uh, what's uh, interesting, I see, in, in what you were talking about, um, I have two questions for you coming out, what your statements were. One is this idea of having the artist uh, also play their own work so that as they envisioned it, it can be um, appreciated by the public. But it turns out that when Beethoven's Fifth Symphony was first played, uh, and reporters were outside of the concert hall and interviewing people as they came out, and they would say, well, what did you think of the music? And they said, well, it sounded like cats meowing. So that's my first question, is the idea of the public and the idea of uh, how, how they tra are transformed. And the other question I have for you is uh, when the futurists, uh, so-called so uh, invented noise, when they understood that uh, the 20th, 20th century was this age of, of a kind of industrialization that was creating its own kind of music and their infatuation and their love with, with machinery also gave them the ideas that this machinery could also produce wonderful noise, as Duchamp's uh, paintings were, sh were also about this kind of industrialization and uh, anti-hand uh, making uh, and art. Um, what happened is that something else very important happened, and I want to ask you about this. There was the invention of the tape recorder, and what I'm asking is this question. Noise is a very difficult thing to repeat. If you hear one of my speakers, or you go to a noise concert, and you, I ask you, can you repeat it? Can you, can you mimic uh, what you just heard? It's almost impossible. So I was wondering, is this relationship of the futurist to noise a manifestation that it could be first proven, that it could be, it's something real, that you could, it was recorded, and therefore they could listen to it over and over again? So those are my two questions. I think the, the last question about the identification of noise is very, very important. Yeah. Precisely because when you hear noise on a tape, uh, you cannot repeat it. Yeah. Yeah. This is a big difference the music. Yeah? Yeah. The music, in my opinion, unfortunately, is so successful because you can repeat it. Yeah? Yeah. This is called melody. Yeah? You start with some notes, the people know later how to continue. Yeah? Statistically spoken, huh? when you hear three elements of music, and you can predict the next element, the next note, huh? then statistically spoken, it is a lot of redundancy. Huh? Mm -hmm. So, say, music is more about redundancy huh? instead of innovation. Huh? 
Noise is pure innovation. Yeah? 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 Because every second you don't know what is the next, next sound. Yeah? So you cannot predict it. Yeah? For me, most of the music is boring because I, I can predict ahead seven minutes what is coming. Yeah? 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 Because the basic question for a composer, according to Schoenberg, yeah? which we should take serious, uh, uh, is one of the best composers we have in the 20th century. He said, what is the problem of composition? And he said, how to get from one note to the next note. Huh? You have a note, then you must think what should be the next note. Huh? Then you have rules of harmony, of composition, etc. Huh? And he tried to avoid huh, subjective expression. That's very good. Huh? So he wanted to find a mathematical rule, the 12 tones, to the harmony, huh? to, to make rules, algorithms, huh? how to get from one note to the next one to solve this problem. Huh? But now, but Nature Samuel brought what we said before, he brought information and in order into it. No? With noise, it's pure entropy. Yeah? And therefore, people can't remember, people can't repeat it, and therefore, they don't want to hear it. Yeah? Yeah? So, in fact, I would, my answer would be the, the channel capacity of our brain yeah? is too low yeah? to estimate noise. If it would be higher, if the evolution would be higher, yeah? so in the next one million years, we will be capable to estimate noise. Now, our channel capacity in our brain is not developed enough to, uh, to, to, em to emancipate noise, to understand noise, and to enjoy noise. No? Today, noise is something uh, like any sound on the street, is we don't want to hear. Yeah? Well, people say, always, always say it's such a wonderful ecstasy to listen to music with all these compositions. Yeah? This is, I would say, primitive, yeah? seriously. Yeah? Yeah? I can give you an example why. Huh? When you are growing up as an animal, the first thing you must do was to develop what they call the detection of motion. Huh? Huh? When you are in the jungle, huh? if you see a black point, you must know is it far away, huh? it can be here in one minute, and is it a panther, or is it a little, a little snake? Huh? If it's a little snake, huh? you say, I don't, bear, don't care. But when you see it could be a panther, huh? this little point becomes big here, black panther. Then, and if you make a wrong, uh, a wrong detection of motion, then you are dead. Today, when you go on the streets, uh, um, young people, when you play uh, sound of cars, young people can tell you what car it is. Mm. They can identify the car by the noise. They can even identify the noise, but also the speed. Yeah? Yeah? And this is what, when you walk in the city, you cannot identify the noise. You'll be killed too, because you have to know this is now a bicycle, this is a car, and this car is driving fast. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we have to learn, the more complex our environment becomes, the more we have to learn to deal with noise. And it is a pity. And several artists who work in the field of noise are working for the evolution of mankind. They're working to expand not only the vocabulary of music, they also work to expand our moral plasticity. This is why we have the word. We have to expand the faculties of our brain uh, to understand to, to process more of the, act, of, of the spheres of electromagnetic waves. Yeah? So the spectrum, what we can now treat for our ears, mm -hmm. is very small. We have to expand the spectrum yeah, to enjoy the spectrum of electromagnetic waves. Precisely. Okay, I just want to ask, oh, and, and please, I'm just sorry, it's, just, it's a follow up to the question, but then sorry. Um, this is, uh, the reason I asked you this question is because the purpose of this exhibition where I had three noise works and the improvisational score downstairs, was that uh, noise and the possibility of the future. Because music, because um, in music uh, is preemptive in the sense that you, you, know, you can learn a melody because you know what to expect in the next few seconds or next whatever. There's a kind of quality of the future with musicality, whereas noise is a kind of, it can't be algorithmic, this is the concept. As we move into an algorithmic world, in a world where the future of our own desires, our feelings, what our shopping is, good, what we're gonna buy, what we're gonna do, the kinds of things that algorithms are kind of foretelling us for the future, then noise becomes even more important as a modality of resistance. And that, I, I was wondering if you could make a comment about that, and then sorry. There's this famous mathematician, one of the best we have, his name is Chai Tin. 
and he has made a book about randomness, uh, uh, about randomness. So precisely what it is, how to describe what John Cage called change as a chance uh, or a change operations. It's better to call it random. Uh, uh, what you described, noise is very close to not only to entropy but also to, to random. Uh, so precisely, the Chaitan says, uh, as a mathematician, very strong statement, a universe yeah, is a mathematical universe, but built on randomness. It's all chance operations. Yeah. And therefore, it is a noise is precisely the acoustic entrance, yeah, the acoustic uh, door to this new world we have to enter. Yeah. We are used to the old world of information and all etc. And now, since you speak also about about social organization, no, now. Uh, our social organization, our society, is modeled as an illusion of order. Huh? Uh, but now, more and more, what they call fake news and things come in. Yeah? So we realize at the very moment, with all these uh, happenings in the, in, the, in the mass media, uh, there's more noise than ever, more fake news than ever. Huh? So these are kind of perverted forms of noise. Huh? Now we have to learn what is real noise. Huh? And besides, uh, to, to, to be capable huh? in the age of social media to have a new kind of social order, we must deal with the randomness of noise. Uh, otherwise, we will become victims, uh, precisely, of fake news. Uh, uh, and, the, and the social powers who want to, who want to found a, a society built on fake news is just happening now. Uh, this is a very heavy attempt to have a new order, social order, which is built. The heart of the order is fake news. Uh, so you cannot make any more difference between what is uh, emotional reality and what is uh, sensual reality, etc. etc. No? Uh, so it's very important that artists move forward to save our future uh, into the field of noise. Uh, in noise, it's very clear, we have to handle these new concepts of randomness, etc. etc. No? That, uh, Naturally, uh, if we have tools like uh, correlation of data, prediction, etc., who can help us uh, uh, to navigate through so this two kind of noisy universe? Uh, yeah. Maybe this is just um, something completely different, but I have two thoughts that I would like to um, mention. Um, first, um, okay, music can be pleasant for us and noise can be disturbing or making us feel uncomfortable um, if it's too loud or uh, all over or whatever or just dissonant but um, the perspective of time is also interesting if it's new noise or sounds that we have never heard before and cannot connect to it might be disturbing or irritating but if it's noise that we heard in our past it can be highly emotional like um, the noise of a playground or the cacophony of, of Okay, screaming is also a human voice involved, but maybe at the beach we hear the waves, which is a regular sound. Not music, but a regular sound which makes us calm, but in combination with maybe screaming children playing around, also loud from time to time, or not, not predictable, like real noise, makes us feel like, wow, this is a situation that I recall and that, that I felt well in, or I personally like it so much in the opera and the rehearsal of the orchestra before the... Um, a presentation before the opera starts and it's dissonant, it's not predictable, it's also a kind of noise but it kind of transports this excitement, what's about to come now, so, um, or maybe some of the, um, I know someone who would like the noise of a powerful motor car, um, we hear the power, this touches us emotionally, so the emotions are not to underestimate but mostly I think it's like in music, what we heard before, what is connected to memories, so there is some noise which is highly emotional and, and not um, emancipate, emancipating, but really like drawing us back into something where we have been many times. And the other thing, completely different maybe, but also um, the question is, is super, um, um, how can you show noise? How can you exhibit noise? And we are here, this is our everyday life, we are in a, a micro museum or a middle museum, a museum situation where we are very close to our public. I mean, I speak to everybody who comes into the gallery. And um, noise installations can be very interactive, or in a lot of museums I, I saw noise installations which um, are switched on by your presence, like you move along and you influence what comes out by your movement. And here, um, 
we don't have these two pieces switched on all the time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but when people come in, we show them to them and switch them on for them, like in their honor. And with their presence, with their visit, something happens. So they take it personal. They stand there and it's like, oh, yeah, mm, it's noise, but they feel like, okay, this is made for me, or this is switched on for me. So this is a kind of immersive or interactive or very personal effect that I think is a big chance because there's not this mirroring painting visitor, but really this has something to do with me. Few mentions uh, I would like to elaborate before I come to your final question. What you said, repeated in a certain sense, what Warren already has asked uh, about tape recorders, etc. The point is with contemporary music or nurse music, that the so called tie eh, to the listener is cut. Eh? So, classic music by harmony, by reason, you can predict. Eh? you can remember a melody. Yeah? Yeah? For example, it's a piece what you experience tonight, you cannot predict the next second. Yeah? What you will try, what you will say. Yeah? Yeah? That means precisely the tie, the string to the listener is cut. So, yeah? so this is what Adorno, uh, uh, why Adorno was against more or less against modern music, yeah? because he said, it's a, it's a classic music, it's a tie, yeah? so you can follow, we have reason, melody, etc. Yeah? But even now comes the point, even popular music is against reason. No? So there's a song called I'm a Slave of Reason by this woman, Church, Ray Schultz. Another song is called Hits Me with a Reason Stick. Uh -huh. So even popular music is tired of reason as a important <laughs> element of music. Why is that follow reason and melody in classic music? So in that sense, uh, uh, in another logical theory of music, classic music is much behind. Uh -huh. Between, uh, behind popular music. Because the point is precisely when he has, he has a word, not a plasticity, no? that's the top of the collection, uh, that we have to learn how can we train our brain uh, with a chain of signals, what we call, uh, what we call music. No? So in fact, even romantic, in romantic time, there was a man called Mr. Ritter, and he wrote a book called Physik as Art. No? No? So even romantic was not about emotion. The people who later came, yeah, they, they misread romanticism as a movement of emotion. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the key work is called Physik as Art. Yeah. So what we do today, an exhibition like this, turn art back to physics. Yeah. We want to have scientific answers to the question, how to get from one note to the next note. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to rely on my subjective expression. Yeah. For example, some people here have developed northern nets, yeah because knowledge can help us to compose noise in a new way, you know, which you cannot do you know, with the old uh, composition techniques. Server in the museum today, the situation is different. You know? when, when you want to present this kind of things, the, the visitor is somebody who shares, you know, who comes in in a working place. You know? He doesn't come in as a tourist. You know? For, uh, in the normal museum, you have trophies, famous paintings, famous objects. You get like a tourist and say, I look now for 10 seconds on this famous painting, and then another 10 seconds for another painting. And you walk out and you have no share, no knowledge, you have not participated. When we move in this kind of new uh, environment with new artists, then you have to give people a chance uh, to participate, to share, it, to be a good <coughs> worker. Uh, you have, as a journalist, say, time demand. Huh? Huh? This is the only way that people really have a chance to understand it, because this kind of music. You can't, you, this kind of illustration, you cannot understand one moment, not you have to learn something. No? So we become a participant. This is the way how we will change the museum in a kind of uh, laboratory, uh, in a kind of lounge. So a mixture of Club Mediterranean, where you can relax, but also the same time in the kind, the kind of scientific laboratory. No? Yeah, I, know, I was going to say something just to react about what you said about pop music. <laughs> I remember one of the lines that Gustav Mesker used to love and repeat to me is, pop will eat itself, which is you know, so accurate to what can be nice. But also I just wanted to come back earlier on, you mentioned quite rightly, Throbbing Gristle. Yeah. And uh, of course we know what they stand for, industrial music for industrial people. 
but now it seems like listening to you and being in one show, we're more in a post-industrial um, music or post-industrial people, aren't we? Maybe you want to comment about, you know, the relationship of, of where we are now, therefore. What is it to be post-industrial, something that you have written about quite often? What we described before classic music is, as we know, it is defined as temporal medium. No? Music is about time. No? Yeah. Sculpture is about space. This is a classic idea. No? But uh, contemporary music, sound art, is more about space. No? No? You have said about time. You have 50 loudspeakers, you have a sound pavilion, and many, many things. So reception is already special. No? Maybe you go today, we call it ambient music. No? Maybe you go, you have here sounds, here a car, you have a radio here. No? So all of the complete environment uh, is, uh, is, is a source of music. No? So it's not only more that you sit in a concert hall, it's just one source of music. Uh, so, and you say you can play with it in fact, for instance, your concert tonight, you move around the players, uh, and you, etc. etc. No? So the reception is not really special. No? Mm -hmm. Now we have to learn that the production of music could also be special, no? not be just a temporal medium. No? And this is for example, very, very clearly formulated by some modern composers, huh? like Bottle Feldman. Huh? When you look at the metronome, tuck, 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 huh? so it's a machine. Huh? So classic music was always a time, it was a time machine, huh? Huh? terrible time machine. Huh? Huh? It was even a prison, huh? black, 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 all the time. Huh? So it's what we call interval theory. Huh? Huh? But an interval theory means a measurement of time, straight like industry. Huh? Huh? Now, that means music was a slave of time, terribly. If ever, uh, I feel uh, uncomfortable when I listen to music. I feel like a prison, and they press me down, they squeeze me down into the music of time time structure. Therefore, a composer like Motor Feldman, he said just the opposite. I don't want it, I don't want to have music as a slave of time. I want time to be a slave of music. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Huh? Time must be. And how can you do it? When you change, you know, modern processing, no? when you read it, what you say at the beginning, when we move it to the brain and have tools to change our modern processing, no? we can learn them to be become free of time. No? Because at the moment, our brain is a temporal signal. No? We have iteration, wind, firing, excellent, etc., synapse, etc. So we have everything what we see is not special, everything what we see is a, proce a procession of signals in time. No? And now we can say we can free ourselves. No? with all kinds of new tools, yeah? that music uh, is higher yeah? than time. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That time becomes a slave of music. This is the direction we, we have to go. And one part of this is that music becomes a spatial medium, not anymore just a temporal medium. No? Yeah. Because it's, it's space, you have more freedom. To give you some example, when this house is a small for a gallery, for the artworks, you can hire the next house. You can expand the space. Yeah? But you cannot expand in time. No? When it's after 24 hours, you cannot, you cannot say, my work is finished and now I add five, five hours. Unfortunately, you cannot add five. But you can add five square meters to any place. No? So you can expand in the space, but you cannot expand in time. No? So the, the music for the future, and this is what they have, music can help us uh, to uh, discover this kind of new future. Yeah. And also, you redefine the museums, because you redefine the museums by four walls. Here, yeah, the sound can actually explode, explode the walls, quite literally, also does not need walls. So that's quite interesting, you know, with regard to the code you mentioned by Stockhausen, saying, I want space, whereas, well, space is music, because we know that it's just a tiny thing. Well, first of all, when you think about the um, <coughs> relationship of uh, Foucault to Deleuze and the whole idea of uh, the disciplinary society or the society of control, that transition is exactly what what you're talking about, this kind of idea that the footplate, the architectural footplate is no longer relevant in, in our moment of information society, which has moved into cognitive capitalism. But I wanted to answer your question because I found it fascinating because I think that the basis of your question was that noise could be remembered and that noise played a fundamental role in our emotional memory, that the kinds of, uh, that it, and, and that, when you talk about effect, effective ecologies or the ecologies of, 
of feelings and emotions and how they are how they become embedded in, in, in our memories in our long-term memories and how they become rejuvenated into our working memories when we when we are stimulated by a picture of something like a picture of our, our mother or whatever I found that very interesting because uh, so much of sound art so much of sound art is that famous piece uh, where they record the sound uh, uh, at the Tate Museum uh, at the bridge. There's a whole series of recordings where there are sounds that we don't even hear. There are these almost um, unconscious sounds that, that are existent, and you need special kinds, of, uh, special kinds of instruments to even hear them. When I made this piece in the back, um, uh, Double um, Sausage Tango, which is based on a neural network, I was thinking about a lot of the things that you were thinking about and also the kinds of things you're thinking about. Because what this piece is all about, it's a neural network, it's an artificial neural network, but instead of formulated scientifically to in which the inner, inner, inner uh, mechanisms of that uh, be between the input and the output, the inner kind of workings of the neural network, instead of being based on scientific principles, are based on artistic principles of found objects. Everything there is a found neon. And all the found neons in that piece, in the artificial neural network, are based on their own particular histories, their own particular emotional histories. Some of them were parts of artists' works that never got completed. Some of them were part of signs that were at apartment stores. Some of them were never were just experiments that were never made. And when they're put together, they they are they come together to make this this kind of processing machine, which is both in time and space, and and you know and allows for memories that are um, combinations or assemblages or machinic assemblages in the Lusian ways of kinds of memories in time that are not predictable. So that's, I think. Sure. Also what's interesting is, I'm sorry we've touched upon, but not really in depth with the, the idea of the public which is the control of the museum, yes, but also how does the public react to noise? What is noise to the public? What is, is <laughs> the public makes noise? I don't know too, and I am including myself there, of course, within that, there's a lot of noise right now. So I'm interested also to think about you, I mean, you have redefined what the museum can be. You've um, put the, full, the, the milestone of the museum for the 21st century with that kind, obviously. You have defined the museum in, within the notion of the post-industrial age, so therefore is, is the museum even still relevant? And how does the museum generate noise? That's something that I find fascinating. Among, among the, one could even argue, and now we touch upon the other side that I was um, alluding at the very beginning, the noise of the images as well. And how does that saturation which the museum put forward still is more than ever relevant in the age and time that we live in? I would like to have a few of your comments about that. In science, we already have this phenomenon, what they call city science. Huh? Uh, that means uh, when you have in chemistry, the possibility of one million variations of proteins, yeah, it, would, it would need about five years for one team to make all the calculation. Yeah? So you can say through, through social media networks that thousands of citizens can participate and make their own on home computers variations of combinations of proteins. Yeah? And then they send them in, they send the machines, and then therefore the process of five years can be reduced to one year. Yeah? And it's a very helpful cooperation. Yeah? But now comes exactly will happen in culture. Uh, uh, we have uh, not only a citizen science, but we have also the citizen artist. Uh, this is a dangerous concept because it's a very against the old concept of the artist, of the sovereign individual. Uh, but this is also the point, since this was always an illusion. Uh, uh, the artist is a model of the sovereign individual because this kind of individual, individuality slowly will disintegrate, you know, see it. Uh, Okay, so what comes now is precisely um, that we also realize that our normal education system, so university, etc., does not function. Huh? Huh? Every year we can read the newspapers, we play with them later to Bologna. We can read every year that the, the degree of 
uh, of education is shrinking and people can read it and more people can write them, etc. So what we need is now new para-institutional education systems. And this is precisely the museum. Mm -hmm. So when, for example, the same before, uh, when music is not played anymore in, uh, in concert halls as well, the same happens with the art forms of cinema. Huh? In the moment cinema, you don't see anything anymore huh? which would not interest you. Huh? So the, the only films, we have a little bit of program cinemas in Germany, we can see art films. Huh? i give an example. Huh? When films win a prize in Cannes, huh? for example, from Gregory or Eva, huh? so I phone the guy after three years, I would like to, to show your film at said Cannes, which you have won the gold in Cannes. Huh? And then I ask him, what would you ask for it? Huh? Then he says to me, all the to fly in. Fly me in the same way, so cheap. He was the first one in Germany to hold me, to show the film. Huh? You see, we have people who have been a prize in Cannes, so they are not shown as a cinema. Huh? Again, 20 years ago, you could make something in television. Right. Now it's also impossible. Therefore, so many people now move into the museum, even this film. Some of these people from the film museum move back to Hollywood, like Steve McQueen and, and, many, and some others. No? But more it's a museum becomes also a place, not only for modern music, also for modern film. Yeah? And that means it becomes more and more a, a site for different kinds of information. Yeah? Yeah? So uh, when people come in and say to me, why do I have not heard about it over here? So this is why we exist. Therefore, so for, for example, I'm against pornography in the museum because if somebody wants to know about pornography, he can go to the radio station. There's a lot of magazines. I don't have to offer the same information like the radio station. We have to offer a different kind of information. Yeah? Yeah? We have to become a different kind of educational site. Yeah? And uh, we have and everything what you don't learn by magazines, yeah? what everything what you don't learn uh, by the mass media, we can offer it to them. We have become very specialized there, yeah? and we can do it. Yeah? In, many, in many things. So, for example, when you watch German magazines for 20 years, what is to the cover? It's all about German angst. They're all afraid about the future. Robots will come and take away our workplace, etc. It's the only place of detoxication. It's the most no? The poison comes from the mass media, combat poison. But detoxication can happen in the most And we give them the anti poison. It's the antidote. Perfect. Would you like to go on with this? Otherwise, I would like to put in another. I would like to come back to both of you who studied medicine so, um, and to the neural um, level of all this. And with your photographs uh, next door, double vision, there's something happening with the eyes and the brain and how do, what does the brain do with the information that comes through the eyes and the same through the ears. Like I find very interesting, um, for example, um, patients who suffered from a um, sudden deafness, Hörsturz in German, uh, they often suffer from tinnitus, a ringing in the ear, constant um, noise, self-made noise, produced by your own brain. Um, and this can be cured or at least uh, relieved by playing music or listening to music where this very special frequency was filtered out. So the lack of this one sound can help you to, yeah, like, um, balance um, this disease or this um, suffering. So, what is your um, idea about this neural um, level and and acoustic pieces? Well, um, I do think that I, I didn't know that you had studied medicine. It was something that we um, shared. Uh, there's actually funny. There are a lot of artists that have studied medicine. And one day, I would love someone to do an exhibition. And musicians. And musicians as well. Um, it would be very interesting to see a show about that. Because I think there would be some very interesting um, conclusions from that. Um, you know, not only uh, the relationship of art and science and all of that. Because I, you know, I have probably a little different viewpoint about the relationship of art and science than you do. As far as I know, I might be wrong, so please, I don't mean to uh, be uh, you know, critical of that, because I really believe that, um, 
that science can demystify aesthetics in art production. I think that art production, one of the most important things about being an artist is to create wonderment and to create mystery. And I think that too many times the art and science projects that I've seen or the art and science people who are promoting and giving out money are interested in, um, in this kind of art that is somehow demystifying or um, and parasizing art. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of against that. I just make that up because uh, uh, it's something I became an artist and there were reasons why I became an artist. I mean, artists, being an artist saved me. I mean, to be honest with you, I was called to be an artist. Like a priest is called to be a preacher. I was called to be an artist. That's all there is to it. And I'm not the only one. When you're called to be an artist, nothing gets in your way. If you have to change your whole life, if you have to destroy everything in your life, talk about auto-destruction. This is what these pieces are about. That's why they're called you know, the story of kind of self-destruction, you know, is that when I became an artist, I destroyed my whole life that I had. I had, you know, as you know, um, some of you know, I was an eye surgeon. I was a professor of eye surgery. I had been a professor of eye surgery and a professor of art. I'm one of the only people who ever had. My brother always introduces me that way. <laughs> but anyway, um, I uh, kind of destroyed my whole life and went to Berlin and became part of the uh, Battalion Kunsthaus DAD, and I was uh, invited by them, and I decided, okay, I'm going this time. I'm not going to say no. And of course, it required me to take apart my whole life. But it didn't matter, because I was called. Okay, I was called to being an artist. And I have never looked back, so, you know, that's just one thing. I don't know, did you have that experience at all? Uh, you had the same experience? First of all, we can be lucky as to start in medicine. So I did it seriously for three years. I did it also examination for three years because therefore we have a basis of vocabulary. Both said they understand what is going on today. Eh? Otherwise, if you have not started medicine, you would not understand neuroplasticity and concept exists. Uh, so when you start medicine, you have a general knowledge about chemistry, physics, anatomy, etc., etc., which helps you later to follow the discourse Natural sciences. Uh, mm -hmm. Coming to the situation of artists, uh, um, when I was part of the Vienna Action Group in the 60s, uh, we had been invited to 66 to the same as the structure of arts and culture. But the people in London had no money for the travel and they, did, and they had no money where we could send a hotel. Uh, so I went with my friends of the Müller and the Bruce to the cultural head of the city of Vienna and said to him, we want to support us with some money to go to London. I said, he looked at us and said, and I was 10 years younger than other ones, but I could speak a little faster and better than the other ones. Uh, so he looked at me and said, Mr. Weibel, why are you here? And asked me for such a situation. I said, then look at the door. It's scared you are cultural head of Vienna. And we are artists. Uh, so he looked at me and said, you are artists. You are everything else but not artists. Uh, so I said, I can, this was 66. I can prove that you are artists. So they said, oh, no, you are like killers. So, how, so no, this is precisely the reason why I can't lose the artist. Remember the famous play by Kokoschka, Murder, the Hope of Women. This is a very famous scandalous play by Oskar Kokoschka, Murder, Hoft of the Frauen. No? So you see, no? so we are, we are the legitimate uh, successors of Klimt, Schiele, and Kokoschka. No? So they said, but this is a problem. These three people have not been artists either. Mm -hmm. 66. No? In Vienna still there was a reluctance, so I know precisely I was rejected as an artist. Uh, but the funny thing was, 10 years later, when it was clear that I'm not an actual artist, I was also a media artist, sent my, my people, my own old friends, said, Peter, you're not an artist anymore. <laughs> so I have experienced it two times. One time from an exterior milieu, and then from an uh, interior milieu. So, mm -hmm. so the question, therefore I don't care. Huh? You mentioned that um, music is redundant and uh, noise is uh, more open and possibly is the future. Um, you also mentioned neuroplasticity and we have to train our brains to um, uh, take in a larger variety of sound or noise. Um, 
also using the museum to exhibit noise. Is there a, a way using all this information to predict what sound or what music can it be, or pop music maybe in the next hundred years, or using al algorithm or uh, using all these elements together? Because, for example, I, my impression that music or pop music became faster through the time. Like my, my parents, I remember they couldn't stand the music I was playing because it sounded like noise to them. Because maybe they were not trained to listen to this music. So I'm just curious, like, could we predict um, what music or pop music gonna sound like? Is it gonna be more noisy to us, or? Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> Oof, I have to like formulate. Okay. <laughs> I just want just um, just a precise, a final question. I think what he's asking, um, uh, letztendlich fragt er, kann es sein, dass also meine Eltern haben nie die Musik gemocht, die wir gespielt haben, für die war das Neues, also Geräusche, äh, weil die Musik immer schneller wird und kann es sein, dass jede Generation also immer schnellere Rhythmen hat und dass die vorherige äh, Generation sich da nicht dran gewöhnt hat und deshalb das als unangenehm. Do you, do you think we can predict what the music or pop music gonna sound like in the yeah. considering all these elements together? So, yes, that's a correct observation. Yeah? That uh, it, it's from generation to generation, the scope of this consonants and dissonance uh, becomes changed. Yeah? Uh, but for, your, for generations, three years ago, uh, uh, three, de three decades ago, was dissonant, today is already consonant. Yeah? What was 19th century was Dissonance to the uh, consonants, no? but was disharmony to the harmony. No? So, in fact, uh, uh, since we are living in such noisy environment, no? we developed as an organism and we learn to, to recognize patterns, it's even the so called noisy channels. No? And so, uh, the judgment of people, what is consonant and, and not, uh, what is dissonant, is a subject, is a subject prejudice. No? It, it changes from generation to generation. No? Yeah. It's the same, what, what, we, what we can learn is yeah, that sometimes uh, we have social conditions as a society itself does, uh, does, not accept, does not accept anymore a certain kind of complexity. Yeah. So, some, in some sense, in some individuals which are still into complex ideas uh, are, uh, how should I say, are disregarded. Yeah, yeah. And marginalized uh, because society wants a reduction of complexity. Uh, uh, this is what we are living now at the moment. Uh, at the moment, we are most institutions of our society, from politics to university, most, not everybody, uh, uh, is looking for a reduction of complexity. Uh, and so, this is what they call populism, uh, which is a wrong word uh, because populism would be listed to the people, which is not so the case. Uh, uh, and therefore, we have now a danger that we, we don't accept dissonance anymore. We don't accept noise anymore. No? All, everybody wants the same answer. No, first of all, everybody wants to have the same questions. No? Yeah? And if you have any of the different questions, then you're already an outsider. No? And then when you have the same questions, everybody wants the same answer. No? This is now a problem. No? We are looking too much for harmony. No? Mm -hmm. Consent. Manifestation of consent is it called. No? Yeah. And music precisely no? can be and noise can be a very disturbing element. No? Uh, it was Plato, he had high esteem of music. But Plato was a philosopher, and he said, who touches music, touches a state. No? Who makes a revolution in music, makes a revolution in social order. No? This is very high esteem, and it's a kind of, 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 of correct. Uh, uh, no? I only say, as long as I can see, uh, that Germany uh, listens to Helene, Helene Fischer. I see no future for Germany. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not only uh, in this timeline, like generations before and nowadays, but also a global thing. I mean, uh, in some other places in, in this world, they listen to completely different music. Sometimes we like it, even if it's exotic, but we like um, the strangeness, this, maybe the soft strangeness, and in some cases, we figure out after a while, no, I will never get used to this in a positive way. 
it will always stay um, yeah, unpleasant for my ears, or, or maybe not for always, but for a long time. So, um, will the globalization bring this un yeah, unified hearing to us once when, when it goes on like that, or will there be always these extreme differences that luckily we still have? Diversity. What is interesting is that we are very much in favor of vision voice. Huh? Yeah. We like, but we are, we are not in favor of acoustic, of acoustic voice. Huh? You know, why does it come? It comes from this that, as you know, the eye is a, at the end of evolution to the sun. Huh? The sun is irradiating the electromagnetic waves. Huh? The cell is a very small part of this very broad spectrum of electromagnetic waves. Is, is processed by our eye. Yeah? So in fact, I would always say, okay, the eye is an answer of solution to the sun, but not a very good one. Yeah? Yeah? Because first of all, the, uh, we could process more than just a small spectrum, so short of frequencies, but then also, uh, nature made a mistake, the distance between our two eyes is not big enough. Yeah? Yeah? If we would have the eyes here, we would see much better. But nature said, made a decision, we look beautiful. No? We would see better with eyes here and here, but we would not be as beautiful as now, no? because this is the right distance that people look beautiful. No? People you think have, so. You wouldn't have depth of perception. Exactly. Our ears or our eyes over here. Exactly. You don't have depth of perception. You need, or you need a, yeah. a, a no, no, overlap. We would have more. We would have better. We'd have greater yeah. Uh, yeah. peripheral vision. Exactly. Insect eyes. But yeah. we yeah. wouldn't have. Well, this is something. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. But so, <laughs> so, so, so what, what, Professor, what, 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 what comes about what we learned? Yeah? Because our eye is not very good as an organ. We develop, we develop, we develop tools. We need the microscopes, the telescope. With the help of machines, we can suddenly see much, much better. Yeah? Yeah? So that means science starts and natural perception ends. Yeah? What we see with our eyes it was not enough because it's a very deficitary organ. Yeah? So we develop microscope. Uh, telescopes, many, many things, we can't feel faster. But we developed not much for our ears. We developed loudspeakers, uh, uh, we developed radio, etc., but not enough. Uh. So at the moment we're living in a kind of visual culture. Uh. Visual culture is dominant, uh, unfortunately. So now what we do is precisely to develop also technical tools to develop our acoustic, acoustic culture, uh, to balance it, to balance it. Uh. And so we have because uh, our machines, yeah, it's called television, telephone, telefax, it's all about distance, tele means a Greek distance. Yeah. So we have developed a technology which can develop much better the telesensors yeah, or distance sensors, yeah, not our sensors of proximity. Yeah. So we have to restructure yeah, in the next hundred years our technology. Yeah. I ask you to do it. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Ann-Kathrin Gunze, who, who um, will later on speak about uh, Italian futurism. And that is my question now um, in regards that we had, so this, this, what you started at the beginning, 1913, now 2013, so this 100 years, and so many people, so many artists were interested in 1913 in music, in the futurism. They were combined with, with paintings, with photography, architecture, Done, so everything was, was together. What's about this today? Because we are now in exhibition where we have painting, we have neon works, we have acoustic works, we have installation, we have noise, we're speaking about it. Is this uh, so like a time that all these different medias are coming together? And, and the other question is, what I'm very interested in is, is that noise and, and all what has to do with acoustic things have a certain time, so one comes after the other. Whereas when you have um, images like this visual flu, so all these images that are just simultaneously coming on our, on our mind, on our view. So what you described uh, is what we call fusion in arts. Eh? Yeah, the idea that everything comes together, as this, as this very famous word fusion in art, was a concept invented by a romanticism. No? They wanted the synesthesia of sound and color, etc. No? They made all this 
color tables here and they wanted, even the England wanted to be live and arts the same. This is precisely, this was not an invention by Fluxus, not by happening, it was an invention by Romanticism. But what is new today, at the same time, we have, so we have Romanticism number two, yeah? so, but we have also Renaissance number two. So the artists today work with uh, computers, with their light, etc. etc. No? So today we have a Renaissance two and a Romantic two. Yeah? So we have fusion art, but with new technical tools. Yeah? Yeah? And this, I think, this will be the dominant uh, current uh, for the next decades. Yeah? Then what you see here, even when he makes a painting, no? like this one, he's dealing with the problems of perception, no? a classic problem, how to paint uh, a rainbow. No? Mm -hmm. And uh, scientifically spoken, as you know, how does a, rain does a rainbow uh, exist? We have millions of water drops, no? and all of this is water, millions of, billions of water drops in the air, no? and they function like mirrors. No? No? They are, they are like prismatic lights, they are like prisms. Yeah? So the white light of the sun comes in, then it's deflected prismatic color. Yeah? And then it is, the sun is a circle, but then by the spirits of deflection, it turns to a half circle. Yeah? Yeah? So it is kind of anamorphosis of the sun. Yeah? And what you see, in fact, is that when you look at the rainbow, it is a kind of virtual, anamorphotic, and a distorted image of the sun. Yeah? which romantics have not been capable to understand. Yeah. Now today, you see, he makes a circle with the rainbow again. Yeah. Then he makes uh, a dark point. So he's reflecting, as a visual artist, an old problem, how to perceive the rainbow. Yeah. Yeah. And as you know, it's it was always made it wrong. Yeah. So I could not see the, the, the right sequence of colors. If there are any questions, maybe, yeah, please. Well, um, I really enjoyed the discussion, um, Peter's scarf. It's, it's a great thing that you just showed to refer to your scarf, that it's made out of the cell of Tarman. And I'm wondering, taking a cell of Tarman more as a piece, well, how to deal with noise in the 21st century, with one reason, because your whole discussion focused on the 20th century and not in the 21st one. You just mentioned, well, it's all mathematically done, so line by line. So the next line in that scarf is a consequence of the previous line, according to a simple deterministic algorithm. So it's, there's, in fact, there, there is no noise. So we should more differentiate uh, between random and pseudorandom. That's the big question. This is really incorporation of this question. So the question is more, um, you talk about randomness and, and noise in the 20th century, so the, the question is if it's not more pseudo-random, more uh, pattern for, for the art in the 21st century. I have, an I have a question to you. Yeah. Um, is noise, is the, is the concept of dialectic materialism or historical materialism uh, relevant to your idea of noise in the 20th and the 21st century? Um, the question arises from a very different direction. I don't know if that's true. Just because it's Marx doesn't mean that it is. Because the fact of the matter is, is that the difference, let me just, you know, the difference in the idea of the way that an object or an idea travels through history, capturing uh, different little pieces of the social, political, economic, and historical conditions as it travels through time and different zeitgeists and different generations and transforms itself and becomes something else. It goes through a kind of dialectic materialistic process. Does noise do that? I don't think noise does that. I don't think noise does that. That is, that's why I find your question so fascinating. And I'm so glad you asked that question because it's at the heart of what noise is. Well, um, just, just to give where I come from is, is more from the material culture um, and uh, first of all, the sciences. And the big question, and this is really trouble for, uh, for the science, because the phenomena they look at, the base is really real random. But if you want to simulate that, you only have the means of computer. So you have the world of pseudorandom, and you have problems of translation. So. The all big things, like we have Monte Carlo simulations, and all these methods are how we can simulate noise. 
ways, knowing that we can't really simulate it in the computer. And so there's a real positive reflection and, and intersection um, between, well, the material world and, and the science itself. And this is, I think, very well reflected in the science is the pseudo random because what we can really do with, with that sort of cal calculation. So this might be also projected to the 21st century, thinking more about this pseudo random. Well, you know, it's interesting that um, Hobbes, the political philosopher, he, at the time uh, of writing uh, the Leviathan, he compared, he, 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 um, he divided uh, people, the world, or politics into three different divisions. Those uh, that could create a people, those, the horde, who are uncontrollable, and the multiplicity. And he argued that the government had to create a people, had to create a homogenous people, and it was easiest to do that. that and then Rancière took, you know, took that idea with the distribution of the sensible and other things. But the fact of the matter is, is that Hobbes was talking about the multiplicity as something that could not be governed, okay? Now we live in a world of customization. We live in a world of the computer. And we have this idea where each of us, our singularities, each of our differences, each of our likes and dislikes, each of our, what we appreciate, the color of a car, or the shape of a car, each of them can be customized. We live in a world of mass customization rather, rather than mass production. And my point is, my point is that technologies can create, can take something that appears disordered and random, like the multitude. And they can, with, with, in, in terms of our computer world, create algorithms and technologies that now can address the individual differences that we have to the point where it no longer matters if the process of governmentalization, power, normalization, can thus no longer needs a people, but can actually rule a multiplicity. Does that help? Yeah, I think, yeah, think we need to discuss it a little later. Okay. But I feel yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that we finish here at that, at that point um, for the moment. So I just want to say uh, to Johanna Reich, hello. So one of the artists of our gallery and we had a wonderful exhibition before this exhibition here in the room. And um, I think we will have a little break now, let's say about 20 minutes and then we continue with the individual lectures. So Warren will start, then I'm Catherine and then Matthew. And um, yeah, I hope that we enjoy the afternoon and have a lot of interesting thoughts together.